Hello, I want to welcome you today to our online worship with North County Church of Christ. We're so thankful that you've joined with us today to those in our North County family and to those who are guests who are joining us from other places. We hope that you're drawn closer to God, that you're uplifted, and that together we're stronger in the Lord as a result of gathering in this way today. We've got a special guest speaker I'm going to introduce in just a little bit. We're going to go ahead and begin today with prayer and then we're going to have communion together, and then uh, we're going to have our message in just a couple of moments. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, 
uh, we pray and ask that all that we do here today in our praise and in our preaching and uh, in our gathering uh, for communion in this format today will bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, that first and foremost. Uh, we pray that uh, through the things that are said, through the songs that are sung, that we're drawn closer to your heart, that those that are joining with us online in this way who, who may not have a relationship with you will come to know you and more about your love and your will for their life. We pray, Father, that you'll be with those in our church family who, who grieve recent losses, who are struggling now with sickness, uh, some even with COVID, and some other with, with other issues, and some, Father, emotionally, uh, and uh, are dealing with mental struggles because of the isolation that this time has brought. We lift everyone up to you, Father, and pray that your uh, hand of love and comfort and healing will be on them. Uh, may they sense your presence. We know that you're always with us. We pray for our nation, God. Uh, we pray that we as your church will be light and salt and that we will not only know you but make you known through the gospel and good news of Jesus Christ. Move in us this year. Uh, make a difference through this church community for your name's sake. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing again before we share together in the Lord's Supper. Open up your heart and your voice where you are and praise the Lord as we lead into communion. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. was a blessing to praise before we take communion together to think about Christ to think about who he is to us not just to us but who he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings I heard about a preacher standing before the church one particular Sunday back when people were all gathered together and they had a custom as we've done in our church at times where everybody stands up to shake hands and greet one another at the beginning of a service and then the minister Looking out at the group as he started to bring everybody back together, he said it would be a shame for us to leave here today without knowing one another. 
uh, without knowing somebody's name and having a relationship, and thus the greeting. But then with a little bit of a twinkle in his eye, he looked at the congregation and said, it would be an even greater shame if you left here today without knowing God. And that's a reminder to us that sometimes churches can lose the main thing. Uh, they can lose the main message. Churches can easily become a kind of glorified service entity or social club or something other than the people uh, who have come to know God through Jesus Christ and are then making him known. Uh, so to know God. And God has made himself known, and he's made himself known through his Son, Jesus Christ. And as we eat and drink the Lord's Supper, we're, we're reminded of the main thing that it is that ties us together. We have come to know God through his Son, Jesus Christ. We've come to know not only uh, of who God is and his word, uh, but we've come to know of our problem, that our problem is sin. And we've come to know that God's solution was to come himself in Jesus Christ. One of the things we know is that Christ himself bore our sin, went to the cross, bore our guilt, bore our shame, and he took it from us. And in Christ, we're no longer condemned, we're free, we're forgiven, we're cleansed. So... It would be a shame for you to not have relationships with other in our church family, harder to do in a format like this, but the greater, the greater shame would be to, to leave and to not know God, to go away from this and to not know the main message, the main thing that ties us together, that brings us together. And it's not really a thing, it's a person. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the Lord's Supper, we remember who he is, we remember what he's done and how he now gives us our identity and defines our life. So we're going to eat the bread and drink the cup together in this way today and remember Jesus in the Lord's Supper. Will you pray with me? Father, as we eat the bread, may we remember that you took on a body of flesh and that in your son Jesus you went to the cross that the body of Christ was sacrificed there to take our sin. And that in the drinking of the cup, uh, the blood of Jesus was poured out to redeem us, to cleanse us, to wash us, to bring us forgiveness of sin. May we remember these things and cherish them and celebrate them as we eat and drink the Lord's Supper now. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a few moments and share the emblems there where you are uh, worshiping with us today. Well, now that we have shared the Lord's Supper together, let me remind you, encourage you to give through giving. We share together in the work that God's doing in this church. We worship him and honor him. And there are several ways to make your offering uh, to North County. You can do it on our app, North County uh, Church. You can do it at our website, northcountycofc.com. There is a give icon on our web website, up on the menu tab, easy to find. Or you can send your offering to our church office, which is North County Church of Christ, 362 West Mission Avenue, uh, number 207, Suite 207, Escondido, California, 92025. That's our mailing address. So I encourage you uh, to make your offering. All right, we're going to have our message now, and I want to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, this is a preacher that has influenced my own ministry in life, not because I know him personally, I don't, and he does not know me, but uh, I've heard him preach on many occasions. I've sat in on classes that he has uh, taught uh, at the church where he ministered for many years. Bob Russell 
is going to be bringing our message today, and I'm airing this message by permission of Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, a church that I've been to on several occasions. Bob Russell uh, has been in ministry for 50 plus years. He is the retired senior minister of Southeast Christian Church, which he got started with a small group of people many years ago, back in the 1960s, a handful of people, and that congregation grew to over 20,000, baptizing uh, thousands of people each year into Christ. Uh, his message that is Christ-centered and biblical is what helped week to week in building that great church. He since has passed the baton of ministry in that church on to others, but occasionally he goes back and preaches there. And not long ago, I listened to his message on Back to Basics and thought that's a message that churches need to hear, and it's a good message for us to hear at the beginning of this new year. You'll be blessed by Bob Russell's preaching and by this particular specific message, and I think it's so relevant to our times. It was preached back in 2016. So again, I secured permission to bring you this message today and to have a guest speaker, which gives me an opportunity to focus uh, this week on a new series that I'm building and working on to start next week. So, without any further ado, uh, here with a message entitled Back to Basics is Bob Russell. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're very kind, thank you. Aren't you glad that your church staff is roughing it for Jesus in California? <laughs> <clears throat> Fundamentals are essential to success. You know that's true, whether you're building a house, whether you're coaching a team, whether you're flying a plane, you better know and apply the basics to be effective. Dr. Matthew Sleeth, an emergency room doctor, told me that's especially true in medicine. He says in the trauma center, when life hangs in the balance and the pressure is on, there is a formula to remind everyone of priorities. He calls them the ABCs of trauma, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. He recalled a patient being rushed into the ER from an accident in which the leg was jutting out at a 90 degree angle below the knee, a horrible injury. And everyone in the ER was paying attention to this obvious fracture, which is D, disability. But they had forgotten A, airway, which was blocked. The lack of oxygen is what will kill you first, he said. As the one running the trauma center, Dr. Slee said, it's my job not to get carried away with what looks terrible, but wasn't the imminent threat. The patient couldn't breathe, so we secured her airway, assisted her breathing, got IVs in to support the circulation. Then, eventually, we gave attention to D, disability, the fractured leg. And then he added, even the most experienced physicians have to go back and review the basics regularly. I think the church in America desperately needs to review the basics. We are entering a period of moral emergency in this country. And if we are gonna survive spiritually, it is vital that believers have a solid grasp of the basics of the Bible. First John 2, 24 says, see that what you heard from the beginning remains in you. As I visit churches across the country, it's my observation that many preachers are reluctant to preach on doctrine for fear that they are going to bore people. But I'm concerned if people don't understand basic biblical truths, their faith will not hold up under cultural attacks or personal problems that come their way. Lasting faith has to be more than just an inspirational moment. It has got to be based on solid convictions that we hold down deep at the core of our existence. So what I wanna to do today is just look at the opening chapters of Genesis and review four foundational principles that I hope will help you stand firm regardless of what happens. Now, 
this is a Bible. <laughs> we believe it to be the inspired word of God. We know that it is able to make us wise unto salvation. The opening verse of the book of Genesis reads, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that brings me to the first basic principle that I want to remind you of today, and that is we are created by God and are ultimately accountable to him. Now that's not what you're hearing in the world. You're usually hearing that you exist at the, as the result of random evolution. You're told billions of years ago there was a cataclysmic event, the Big Bang, that resulted in this complex universe. And in a freak accident of nature, a lightning bolt struck a mass of goo and out came this one-celled amoeba that was a source of all life. Now, evolutionists cannot explain how nothing became matter or how matter became life or how life became increasingly complex. They just add billions of years. That's why Christian apologist Norm Geisler wrote a book entitled, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Because it takes less faith to believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth than in the beginning there's a series of freak accidents that resulted in this complex universe. Now, it's not my intent to get involved in a debate about the complexities of evolution. I'm ill-equipped to do that. But it is my intent to urge you to use your God-given common sense and come to a conclusion about your origin. You instinctively know the difference between deliberate design and random results. Years ago, I was speaking in South Dakota, and I went over to Keystone, South Dakota, and went up to visit Mount Rushmore. Now, if you've been there, you know it's pretty impressive to look up on that granite mountain, and you see there the faces of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Teddy Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln. But let me tell you something not to do if you ever go to Mount Rushmore. Do not nudge a complete stranger standing beside you and say, did somebody carve those out of the mountain or is that the result of millions of years of weathering? <laughs> they would look at you like you're an imbecile. Why? Because we instinctively know the difference between random results and deliberate design and that is too complex to be random results. But let me ask you a question. What's more complex, those faces carved in stone or the face of a newborn baby that's alive with eyes that blink and ears that hear and a nose that smells and a mouth that suckles? How can anybody look at a newborn baby and say, random result, <laughs> millions of years of chance evolution? The Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I used that very illustration several months back at a large church in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it just so happened that visiting that morning was an atheist professor from out of town. She was visiting with her family. When I said, what's more complex, those faces carved in stone or the face of a newborn baby, her phone at that minute pinged with a text message and she looked down and there was a picture of the newborn born to her niece. She came up to the preacher afterward and said, I don't know what's going on, but I'm staying for the next service. <laughs> I hope she became a believer. The Bible says in Romans 1, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So that people are without excuse. God has given us ample evidence in the deliberate complex design of nature to know that there is a creator. Now Genesis 2-7 relates how God created human beings. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Folks, you are not here by accident. You are here by God's design. A God who knows you and who loves you, knows you so well he has the hairs of your head numbered and the, knows the innermost thoughts of your heart. King David wrote, Lord, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. But here's the difficult part of this first principle. You're created by God and you're ultimately accountable to him. 
God sets the guidelines by which we are to live. Started from the beginning. Verse 15 of Genesis 2 reads, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and care for it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now notice, from the very beginning, God set some parameters around man's freedom so that he'd have the most fulfilling and best life here. We are all created with freedom of the will. And we can choose to obey God or we can choose to disobey God. And God says, if you obey me, you'll be blessed. But if you disobey me, you'll, you'll suffer the consequences eventually of, of death. And no matter how much authority you have right now on this earth, you are still a person under authority. You are under the authority of your creator, God. And the Bible says one day we're going to all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to have to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. We're going to have to answer someday, not to political correctness, not to majority opinion, but we're going to have to answer to the creator. I have in my pocket a miniature version of what's called the New England Primer. This was the primary textbook for American grade school children for over 200 years in America. It was first published in the 18th century, sold two million copies. And for 200 years, it's the primary text. There is a section in this book called The Shorter Catechism. And the first question is, what is the chief end of man? And then there's an answer that kids were to memorize. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. For 200 years, American school children had that drilled into them. They got the basics right. One of the reasons that God uniquely blessed this country. But now we've removed God from the educational system and kids are told that they're here as the result of an accident. They're the highest form of animal and their primary purpose is self-gratification. Be true to yourself. Do what comes naturally. And the result is confusion and insecurity and in many cases chaos. I, I just plead with you Christian parents, encourage your kids' giftedness, but teach them from the very beginning they're not the center of the universe, God is. And that he merits their respect. And they are to, to respect God's delegated authority to teachers and parents and policemen and judges, or else we're going to have complete anarchy in our world. I like the way J. Vernon McGee put it. He said, God designed and directs this universe, and frankly, if you don't like the way he's running things, go, off, go out and start your own universe. <laughs> well, if you're not capable of creating your own world, then it's best to acknowledge right now, we're created by God, and we're accountable to him. Now, we're going to turn to Genesis 3 for another basic principle, and that is, we are contaminated by Adam's fall and we naturally gravitate to evil. The end of chapter 2 tells about God creating a woman, companion for Adam. He brought them together, performed the first marriage ceremony. God said, for this reason a man will leave father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Notice, marriage was God's idea for man. Marriage was not the invention of man, something we can totally disregard or easily dissolve or dramatically redefine at our whim. God established guidelines for marriage and the family. But then in chapter 3, verse 1, we read, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, there are a lot of people today who think they're so sophisticated that they can no longer believe in the devil. Who can believe in a talking snake or a red being with tail and horns and a pitchfork? I think one of Satan's most clever ploys has been his ability to make himself look so ludicrous that thinking people don't believe they can accept his reality. But you know what? The same people who reject the devil are scratching their heads today saying, why is there so much evil in the world? What possesses a man to get into a truck and plow into a sidewalk full of people and deliberately kill over 80 people, 10 of them babies and little children? Why so much hatred? Why all this evil in the world? Well, Jesus believed in the devil. And Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. 
Jesus said that he's a thief who comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and that he is the father of all lies. Now, the book of Genesis doesn't tell us about the origin of the devil, but the book of Genesis introduces us to the reality of the devil by saying the serpent was more crafty. Evidently, in creation, the serpent wasn't the lowly, slimy snake that we see today. It was the most magnificent of all the animals. In Kentucky, we think the horse is the most spectacular animal. But in Eden, in its original form, the serpent was the most impressive. And Satan, a spirit being, possessed the most attractive of the animals so he could be visible and communicate with Eve. You know, you go see the movie Jungle Book and all the animals talk. Satan's more crafty than man, and he possesses this serpent. And Satan said, has God really said that you're not to eat of any tree of the garden? That's the way he begins. He questions God's word. You think the Bible's really true? Isn't it full of myths? And then verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the tree, the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now notice Satan has succeeded in getting Eve to focus on the one thing she is not to do. Scores of delicious fruit trees, but she's fantasizing about this one she can't have. And she's intrigued by it. And Satan says to her in verse 4, you will not certainly die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God knowing good and evil. Now notice Satan's tactics because he uses the same formula today. He doesn't have to change. It works so well. He questions God's word. He denies God's word. And then he reverses God's word. As God said you don't have to eat of that tree. You won't die. You leave that. You really live. You'll be like God. You'll know good and evil. And you can be your own boss. Nobody will tell you what to do. Has God said to you that sex is to be reserved for marriage? Really? Marriage is boring. An affair is exciting. Has God said to you you're to give 10% of your hard-earned money to help people in need? That's not true. You use it for yourself and you can live the good life. Has God said to you you're to forgive a person who hurt you so badly? Nah, you get even with them and you'll feel better. Well, verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. Now she is not satisfied to sin alone. So she gave some to her poor defenseless husband. <laughs> not in there, but it should be. <laughs> Who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Satan had told them a partial truth. You eat of this tree, you'll know evil. And it was so intriguing, they ate. But wow, this fruit had a bitter aftertaste. They wished they hadn't done it. They felt uncomfortable with each other and weren't comfortable in their own skin anymore and covered themselves. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, there are many things of which a wise man might wish to be ignorant. Adam and Eve, after it's over, wished that they were ignorant of evil. Verse 8 says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. God had said, if you sin, you will die. And all of a sudden, there's death to innocence. They don't feel comfortable in God's presence. And they don't feel comfortable totally with each other anymore. But the Lord God said to the man, where are you? He answered, well, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you put here with me. <laughs> she gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. He starts playing the blame game. He was the victim. It's that woman. Uh, in fact, God, you created her. You gave her to me. It's your fault, God. God, that's the way you made me. It's your fault. And then the Lord God said to the woman, 
What is this you've done? The woman said, the devil made me do it. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So from the very beginning, people begin to rationalize their sin, blame somebody else. I'll tell you what, if you had to live with my mother-in-law, you'd have an alcohol problem too. <laughs> the government regulations, they just force you to cheat. I'll tell you what, if you coach these kids, you've got a curse. That's the only language they understand. But here's this basic principle again. We have all been contaminated by Adam's fall, and we all naturally now gravitate to evil. A baby can be addicted to crack cocaine. A baby can inherit the Zika virus. We inherit the sin virus from Adam. King David said, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. I've got a grandson who will, he'll make you believe in the doctrine of original sin. He, he's, he's cute, but he can be mischievous. And when he was about three years of age, he got into something he wasn't supposed to get into and his mother walked into the room, saw all the evidence and she got furious with him. And before she could say anything, he smiled at her and said, mommy, you so beautiful. Isn't that cute? No, that's the making of a con man. <laughs> and his mother recognized that. She's dealt with that. Now as the years gone by, he's semi under control. We, <laughs> the point is, we are all created in the image of God and there's something inside of us that wants to do the right thing, but we're also polluted by the sin of Adam and there's a civil war going on inside of us because we naturally are attracted to evil. And just like an apple can have just one brown spot on it, one bruise, and left alone will eventually all turn rotten. So we've all got this sin nature in us, and left alone, unrestrained, we're all capable of horrendous things. Here's one of the foundational differences between Darwinian evolution and biblical creation. Evolution teaches that we began in a primitive state and we're getting better and better and if the environment is right, we'll eventually reach perfection. But the Bible teaches we were created in perfection, Adam fell, and we're tumbling away spiritually, getting worse. In fact, at one point, the world got so bad, so evil, that God had to cleanse it all and destroy it all with a flood because the imagination of man's hearts were wicked continually and violence was spreading throughout the, all the earth. So he wiped it clean, started again. And the Bible says in the last days it will resemble the days of Noah and God will purge the world again by fire. But those people who don't believe in the reality of evil try to convince us that people will do the right thing if we just trust them and give them the opportunity. You see it in parenting. Well, our boy's been so compliant. We're going to give him this phone with unlimited capability at age 13. I don't think he'll ever get into pornography on it. Or you see it in education. You teachers, just let the kids do what they want to do. Don't discipline them. They'll choose the right thing. You see it in foreign policy. If we just show good faith to Iran, they, they won't develop nuclear weapons and they won't try to blow Israel off the map the way they've promised to do. We just got to be good to them. Or you see it in some economic ideas. If we just redistribute wealth, we just practice socialism, all the poor people will be so grateful, they'll work hard even though they don't have to, and the rich people won't be greedy, and everybody will live happily ever after. But where we really need to see the sin nature of man is in ourselves. The Apostle Paul said, I know that in me, that is in my sinful nature, there dwells no good thing. We changed cable providers at our house several months back. The installer said, Mr. Russell, I've got good news for you. What's that? You get all the movie channels for free the first three months. I said, well, I, I, I don't think we, we'll have those. Just don't install them. He said, well, after three months, they'll cancel themselves out. You won't have to worry. I said, well, I, I, I don't want the, that raunchy programming that comes on at night in my house even for three months. He said, well, I understand, Mr. Russell. I've got grandchildren too, and, but I got good news for you. What's that? He said, if th there is a parental blockage feature and you can block all those programs. You're the only one that has the code. I said, well, that's the problem. <laughs> he said, what's that? I said, I got the code. And I, I know my nature. I don't need that opportunity at 1130 at night. So... Don't, don't install. He said, Mr. Russell, I got good news for you. What's that? If you don't take the free movie channels, I can knock $10 more off your bill. 
Really? One free than one. See, it's good to know the carnal nature of man when dealing in business. But every day, Satan whispers these seductive lies into our ears, trying to convince us that good is evil and evil is good and what God calls beautiful is ugly and vice versa. And that brings me to the third principle, and that is we are cursed by sin and eternally condemned already. We're created by God, we're accountable to him, we're contaminated by Adam's fall, and we naturally gravitate to evil, and we're We're cursed by sin and eternally condemned already. God pronounced a curse on this world because of Adam's fall. Sin was a terrible thing. And God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals, and you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. The serpent had been the most impressive of all the animals, and now it's cursed to slither on the ground. I really think this is one of the reasons that people despise snakes for the most part. It's just a creepy reminder of the fall. Then God pronounced a curse on Satan. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel Now, this is the first veiled prophecy of a coming Savior to rescue us. A distant descendant of the woman will come and crush your head, Satan. Jesus is going to destroy Satan at the cross and the empty tomb. But he's going to temporarily strike his heel. He's going to torture Jesus and crucify him. And then God pronounced a curse on Eve. To the woman, he said, I'll make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children, and your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. When my wife gave birth to our first son, when she was in labor, between excruciating pains, she gritted her teeth, and she said, boy, when I get to heaven, I'm going to give Eve a piece of my mind. (laughs) That's the curse. And then he said to Eve, You're going to want to get married, and after you get married, you're going to say, what have I done? My husband is trying to rule over me. And women have been chafing under that inequality to this day. Then God pronounced a curse on Adam. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you not to eat, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you'll eat from it all the days of your life. It'll produce thorns and thistles for you, and you'll eat the plants of the field. And by the sweat of your brow, you'll eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam, you're going to have to work hard, and it's not going to be pleasant. There's going to be thorns and thistles, and there are going to be earthquakes and tsunamis, and there are going to be droughts and floods, and there are going to be diseases and accidents. The Bible says the whole creation is groaning as in the pains of childbirth. The the whole creation is out of sync because of sin. And Adam, from this point on, you're going to begin to age. And as I promised, you will eventually die and return to dust. Now, this third basic principle is that we are all cursed by sin and eternally condemned already. People say, well, the God I believe in is a God of love and mercy, and he would never condemn anybody to eternal death. They say that because they don't understand the horrible consequences of sin and the awesome holiness of God. Adam's disobedience contaminated the whole world. When the Titanic hit an iceberg on April 14, 1912, it immediately began to take in water, and everybody on board that ship for the next two hours and 40 minutes was under their curse. If they did not get off that ship and into a lifeboat, they were doomed to die, no matter how good a swimmer they were, no matter how much they enjoyed the band playing, near my God to thee, they were going to die. And that's a picture of us on this planet without God. The Bible says, now don't love the world or the things that are in the world because the world and its desire is going to pass away. Now Satan will whisper to you, that's not true. You just eat right and exercise. You'll enjoy a really long life. Or you just live a good enough life and God will accept you in the end and you'll be saved. 
But Jesus told Nicodemus, a really good man, unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, how can a man be born a second time when he's old? He can't enter in his mother's womb and be reborn. And Jesus said, unless you're born of the water and the spirit, unless you die to this world and get out of this world and into the spiritual kingdom of God, you can't enter into God's kingdom. And then Jesus concluded the conversation with Nicodemus by saying, John 3, 17, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. For whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. We're under this curse of sin and condemned already. But there's one final very positive principle from Genesis. We have one eternal hope, and that is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There are two verses in this Genesis story that hint that our hope is in a coming Savior. The first we've already read, Genesis 3.15, the coming Messiah would crush the head of Satan. The second is Genesis 3.21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. They tried to clothe themselves with fig leaves. That wasn't sufficient to cover them. So God killed an animal and clothed them with skin. This is the first mention of death in Genesis. God shed blood in order to cover the guilt of Adam and Eve. And that was a symbol that the only way their sin would ever be forgiven was through the shed, shedding of blood. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now you read through the Old Testament and you will see again and again that God required the Jewish nation to kill a flawless animal and bring the blood of that animal, put it on the doorpost for Passover or sprinkle it on the altar in the tabernacle. But the Bible says, the blood of bulls and goats was not sufficient to take away sin. God was just using that ritual to condition them to understand that one day there would come a Savior who would shed blood and forgive them of all their sin. Remember the story of Pavlov's dog? Ivan Pavlov would ring the bell, feed the dog, ring the bell, feed the dog. And eventually when the bell rang, the dog would salivate. He associated the ring of bell with the feeding of the coming of food. All through the Old Testament... All these sacrifices of blood, God was conditioning people without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Then when Jesus first walked onto the scene of his ministry, John the Baptist identified him by saying, behold the Lamb of God who's gonna take away the sin of the world. And just before he died, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And in Matthew 26, 28, he gave the cup to the disciples and said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of your sins. Only Jesus can forgive our sins because only Jesus claimed to be God and then proved it by performing undeniable miracles. Only Jesus lived a perfect life so that he could fulfill the law's demands. Only Jesus could be an expression of God's love for us and yet God's justice and punishment of sin. Only Jesus died an atoning death on the cross. When Jesus died on that cross, it was not a martyr's death. He said, nobody takes my life from me. I give it up of my own accord. It was an atoning death. The Bible says God laid on him the iniquity of us all. I believe that when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, he could look down to 2016 and he could say, I see you, Bob Russell. I see the day you're born in 1943. I see all those sins that you commit your whole life. I see the day you die. And he gathered up all my sin and he died on the cross for my sins so that I could be white as snow. The Bible says the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it's the wisdom of God. Only Jesus came back from the grave. Only Jesus can realistically say to you, I am the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Only Jesus can say to you, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come and take you to myself where there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. You will reign with me forever. Only Jesus can empower you by the Holy Spirit to overcome the temptations in this world so that you can say, I can do all things through Christ that is in me. We're in Christ. We're a new creation. The old nature can be crucified with Christ. That's why Jesus gave this commission to his disciples in Mark 16. He said, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. 
That's the basic task of the church. And if we ever forget that, then we're giving attention to what looks terrible but isn't the imminent threat. It's like rearranging the furniture on the Titanic. John and Doris Foster of our church took care of an elderly widow named Bernice Ely for a number of years. She was a retired Jefferson County school teacher, Sunday school teacher at St. Matthew's Baptist Church. Mrs. Ely was proud of her independence. She got into her 80s and she would say, I don't, I don't ever want to go to a nursing home. I, please don't let them take me to a nursing home. She got more and more frail. And finally, the foster said, Miss Ely, you're going to have to go to a care facility. And she reluctantly agreed. So John took his pickup truck and put a few of her belongings in the truck and headed for the nursing home. And Doris followed with her feeble passenger in the front seat. But Doris got halfway to the nursing home, looked over, and Mrs. Ely was slumped over, and Doris pulled over to the curb, maybe to adjust the seat belt a little bit. But when she touched Mrs. Ely's arm, she realized she had died. She died on the way to the nursing home. Can you think of a better way to go than that? <laughs> and when Doris got to the home, John said to her, where were you? I thought you were right behind me. And Doris said, I was, but we had to stop over by heaven on the way. Now, maybe you might think that's kind of a morbid story to conclude a sermon, but not if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. Only Jesus can forgive our sins. Only Jesus can promise us eternal life. Only Jesus gives meaning to every day that we can live life to the full, knowing we have that hope of heaven. There's one phrase of scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 that summarizes this whole lesson. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ will all be made alive. I really like the song we sang just before I came up. In fact, I was the one that requested it. I'm gonna ask we sing it again. In this broken generation, when all is dark, help us see. In this hour of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear, there's only one foundation. We believe, we believe. I hope you were blessed by that message today. I hope it enriched you spiritually. If we can help you to know more about the Lord, know more about his salvation of Christ, or if you'd like to know more about this church, let us know how we can help. You can contact us at info at northcountycfc.org. That's info at northcountycfc.org. Thank you for joining us for online worship today. Join us again next week at 9 o'clock. I'll have a new series kicking off. We'll say more about that in the week to come. May God bless you this week.